Greetings and welcome. This is Senior English, uh, AP English. Uh, we're now working with the Beowulf epic. These will be our final observations regarding Beowulf before the examination. The great Anglo-Saxon uh, poem Beowulf is a poem of three parts. We often identify these three parts in relationship to the three monsters of Beowulf. Now in the paper that's coming next time, I think it's packet, I think it's writing assessment number 10, I think I've assigned to you the topic of to discuss the motivations of Beowulf. So I'll be talking a lot about that this hour. Let's make sure we understand the three parts of Beowulf real quickly. Part one, anything that has to do with the Grendel monster. Part two, anything that has to do with Grendel's mother. Part three, anything that has to do with the dragon monster and the death of Beowulf himself. So when we speak Beowulf 1, that's what we mean. Beowulf 2, we mean Grendel's mother and the fight with Grendel's mother and Beowulf 3, the end of Beowulf and more particularly the monster. The second thing I would point out about this epic at this, is that this epic is predominantly an epic of lucidity, an epic of speech giving. The action of this poem is fairly limited. You can take the majority of the action of the poem and reduce it down to a few lines. Are you ready for this? That's exactly what your textbook company has done. If you actually go online and read all of the epic poem Beowulf, and you can do this in translation, you'll be stunned at how little action there is and how much talking there is. All right? Of course, if you've ever been around two guys about to fight, physical altercation, it's always interesting to watch this. Rarely do two guys just start wailing on each other. Usually there's some, you know, talking involved. There's usually some kind of back and forth, and then it's escalated, and then finally there will be the punching. It is a fair question to ask. Why before an athletic contest does a coach feel compelled to come in and speak motivational language? Like, dude, let's just go play the stupid game. Why do we have to have this talking beforehand? This is a very ancient motif. We are going to see it instantiated in the poem Beowulf so that the most, are you ready for this? Most important points of this poem for the Anglo-Saxons is not the action of the poem, it's the speech giving that comes before the action. So for each one of these parts, we're going to have very famous speeches. We're going to look in, t in detail at several of these speeches. Why? Because these speeches are the beginnings of what we will call the Anglo-Saxon Code. Sometimes referred to as the Anglo-Saxon warrior code. Sometimes juxtaposed to other kinds of warrior codes. We think immediately, don't we, of the Bushido code. We think of the, uh, you know, think of the Tokugawa, pre-Tokugawa samurai Bushido code. We think, of course, of, uh, you know, maybe the uh, Chinese uh, book of strategy, Sansu's art of war. We can, uh, Mushashi's book of five rings. These are any different number of types of treatises on fighting and strategy. Uh, here we're going to, we're going to be introduced to an Anglo-Saxon uh, warrior code that will become very, very important. See, I want to point out to you, this is very Platonist in my observation here, I want to point out to you how bizarrely ironic it is that at Worland High School, you can walk down this hall next to the gymnasium here and sitting in glass cases on small cutouts of cardboard are the faces of individual athletes. Let's point this out. See, there are, there are certain students who say, it's never occurred to me to ask this simple question about absolutely any face on any piece of cardboard in those cabinets. We could point out an observation. That athlete was successful, but in no way alone for those who, for example, achieved accolades on ball clubs, by definition, the word club or team means more than a single athlete. So, for example, no football player who's on any of those cardboard cutouts is ever represented by the rest of his teammates. 
Anyone that knows anything about football knows you can be the most outstanding of athletes, but if there's nobody else out on the field blocking for you, you're not going to score all the touchdowns that got you the accolades, that got you the ability to have your picture. Or, for those of us who are in individual sports, we think, of course, of swimming and golf and track and those kinds of individual sports, still the observation is made. Where, for example, is the picture of the coach who, for example, instructed the athlete that allowed the athlete to gain the information? In the long history of Orland High School, the argument has been made by any number of those individual tracksters. There's one or two coaches' names who probably should have appeared every time right there at the bottom, because it ain't happening without one of those coaches. Not mention. See, some of you will, the next time you walk by there, you'll make an observation that's a mental note. It's an interesting thing to pull one individual out of a group, put the individual's face on a piece of cardboard, and then put it in a case, trophy case, where that individual gets celebrated over others who stood right next to him or her and helped make those accomplishments possible. By the way, that completely belies the very fact that you had to have an institution called Worland High School for that to happen, those teams to happen. Along with coaches, you had to have administration. Of course, all of those people in that case were student athletes. That is to say, there were teachers involved. Of course, preceding that, there were families and parents involved. Now we start to sound very Platonist, don't we? In other words, about any given individual who would be celebrated in that trophy case, we would say there are at least 15 or 20 people who probably should stand right next to the individual in the picture. Of course, the individual had to have been born, which means for Plato, there were parents, dare we say it, grandparents, and dare we say it, great-grandparents. Of course, Plato would as well point out you can't do that without having some notion of a citizenry, that is to say a polis, that is to say a country. And to that degree, all of a sudden, it becomes almost kind of silly. A lot of times after I say these observations, students will say, I guess I've never, I remember giving this lecture once and then it occurred to me that I had a student sitting in my room who had several of those, uh, you know, in the cabinet, were of course blessed this very hour with the same, and yet the same athletes will say after my observations, oh, you're not denigrating my accomplishments at all, you're actually celebrating them in more full. Absolutely right. We're not saying that those, in, those athletes were not amazing athletes. We're saying, isn't it an interesting thing to live in a culture where those kind of individual <coughs> accolades are represented. I remember attending, I, I do work other places, uh, Okisho High School in Okinawa is the number one private elite high school in Japan. They have the number one baseball program, uh, many argue, in the world at the, at the, collegiate, at the high school level. Uh, and I was there uh, doing other work. And, and I remember they have a trophy case as well. That trophy case is stocked full of pictures, but never a picture without the entire team. I pointed this out, that if you were to come to my high school, we rarely have pictures of the entire team. We normally have pictures of a celebrated athlete. And then I looked, and one of their top athletes was looking at me with the most bizarre look on his face, like, one? You pull one player off the team? Well, yeah, we named them, in fact, all state. R really? They were just stunned by this. They couldn't understand the idea that you would celebrate one. Where does that notion come from that, by the way, for your notes now, we will define as Western in orientation. Okisho is, of course, a more Eastern, Oriental is the old-fashioned word for it, more Eastern philosophic view. Well, this Western notion of the hero is born, first of all, in our stories of the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, without doubt. Notice all three of those epics will celebrate the individual above and beyond the rest of the group. The Anglo-Saxon warrior code, though, is really the first clear British instantiation of this idea. We will have one warrior who will step up and lead and gain all kinds of accolades. The question will be, why does he do it? That's what we mean, for your notes, when we ask the question of motivations. Why does he do what he does? Beowulf is living a nice life as a thane or warrior in another country. He is in the land of the Geats. He's Swedish. He is not Danish. Grendel shows up at Hrothgar's court in Danish country. Beowulf hears about this, gets in a boat, sails to the land of the Danes, 
asked to meet the King Hrothgar, goes in front of the king, and now I'm with you on page 43. His speech to Hrothgar, we're going to have two important speeches we're going to look at in Beowulf, in Beowulf uh, or we're going to have one important speech in Beowulf 1. His speech to Hrothgar is an intriguing one. Beowulf arose with his men, I'm roughly on page 43, I'm roughly at line 134, 135. Beowulf arose with his men around him, ordering a few to remain with their weapons, leading the others quickly along with Herod's steep roof into um, Hrothgar's presence. Standing on that prince's own hearth, helmeted the silvery metal of his mail shirt, gleaming with the smith's high art, he greeted the Dane's great lord. Now, this is, these are lines, obviously, you're going to quote in the paper that you would write on Beowulf's motivations for behavior and for acting. What is it Beowulf says is the reason he's here? Why has he come from another country to defend a peoples who normally he would be fighting against. The Geats and the Danes don't have such a good history. They fight against each other. And now here he is. Notice how he speaks to Hrothgar. Ah, this is the propedeutic nature of our text. If you want to teach young soldiers how to behave in front of their king, you invent a story where you have the greatest warrior of all time standing in front of that king. How does he talk to that king? Notice right away, with respect. Now that's interesting. Because if Beowulf wants to, hey, dude, he's the guy who's the stud on the, on the stage at this point. He can easily kill Hrothgar and take over the land of the Danes, and in the process, kill Grendel. Does that occur to you? Beowulf can do that. He has the power to do that. He doesn't need weapons to kill Rothgar. Dude, he doesn't need weapons to kill Grendel. He'll use his own hands. He's within three steps of Rothgar. He could easily kill the old guy. Why doesn't he? Why doesn't he show up and just take over the kingdom? That would be the Thorsemican thing to do. That would be the Machiavellian thing to do. That's not what Beowulf does at all. Notice we've got rules. When you come in front of the older king, you show respect. You ask. You don't tell Rothgar what it is you're going to do. You have to introduce yourself and, now for your papers writing, you have to tell why you're here, what your reasons are for being here. Take a look at what he says. Hail Rothgar, Heigelik is my cousin and my king. The, uh, you always say where you came from. This is also part of the Anglo-Saxon understanding. You always say your name because your first name means nothing. It's your last name. Why? Because your last name is your family name. So what? You always say, say where you came from. Lineage matters to the Anglo-Saxons. Who is your father? Who is your grandfather? What is that lineage? Notice here for him, he comes with the goodwill of King Hygelic, the great king of another country, we should point out. Notice he says, the days of my youth have been filled with glory. What is that word? Write it down and maybe try to get some sense of it. And some of you will say, oh, yeah, that's called putting a picture on a piece of cardboard. What is glory? What does that even mean? What is glory? What does that word mean to you? He says, the, my, my days have been filled with glory. What does that mean? I'm number one. I'm number one. I'm number one. Notice he doesn't have any problem with saying that. He says, from the time I was young, I was number one. I was number one. Success, glory. Keep reading. Now Grendel's name is echoed in our land. Sailors have brought us stories of Herop, the best of all meat holes, deserted and useless when the moon hangs in the skies, the sun had lit. Light and life fleeing together. My people, uh oh, look at this. This is fascinating. My people have said, the wisest, most knowing, and best of them, that my duty was to go to the Danes' great king. Whoa, whoa, did you see the D word? What's that word? Obligation. Yeah, obligation, duty. Make a note to yourself at 3A, the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant, many years later, K-A-N-T, many years later, We'll make much of this D word. The word is duty. You have a duty. His, he says, my own people have said, you have a duty to go. Does that mean, what does duty mean to you? Does that mean you want to do it or you have to do it? See, think about that. 
Does duty mean you want to do it or you have to do it? Hmm. What do you think, Batson? How do you make that distinction? Duty. Want to or have to? Yeah. It's, or we might say split the difference. Need to. Need to shares with it the commonality of I kind of want to and I kind of have to. That is to say obligatory. I have a duty. Notice we continue. They have, the, 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 the ones he grew up with, they have seen my strength for themselves, have watched me rise from the darkness of war, dripping with my enemy's blood. Notice how Beowulf it is, has grown famous, dripping with my enemy's blood. This notion of trophies is going to be a big dog deal in the Anglo-Saxon motif. When you win, it isn't enough to win. You need a body part. Sometimes that body part in cultures will be extremities. Sometimes it will be earlobes, sometimes it will be hair, scalp, sometimes it will be body parts. And of course, we're familiar with the taking of the phallus as being evidence of sterile or sexual strength. Sometimes it will be hands or feet, sometimes it will be body parts, sometimes it will be internal organs. Of course, the most famous examples here we think of the extraction of the literal, the extraction of the heart itself, right? Taken. You always have something. You're dripping in blood here suggests hand-to-hand -hand combat as well. That is to say, Beowulf is saying, I don't send the men in to fight, and then I take the glory. What epic hero is notorious for that? Achilles said it as much in the Iliad, didn't he? He claims that really Agamemnon is not a warrior. He sends other guys in to fight, like Achilles. Achilles is a guy dripping with the blood of war, just like Beowulf as well. We think here, of course, of the greatest of the warriors dripping in blood of all time, Aeneas, right? Aeneas, the great Roman hero, he's defined by the fact that he fights. Let's point out, by the way, in the history of warfare, this is going to change after Napoleon. Napoleon will be one of the last guys that we ever hear about as a really major general who actually fights in the battle sometimes, right? Why? Because in modern warfare, when you've got projectiles that can be sent over distance, it doesn't make a lot of sense to take the brightest of your minds and put them out there in the front. So what ends up happening is that you've got men who make the plans, and then you have men who fight in the battle. Beowulf is not one of those guys. The Anglo-Saxon motif, you gain glory by actual physically fighting. Notice Rothgar wasn't even there when Grendel showed up, right? Okay. Beowulf's going to say, I'll take care of it. I drove five great giants into chains, chased all that race from the earth. I swam in the blackness of night, hunting monsters out of the ocean, killing them one by one. Death was my errand and the fate that, that they had earned. Now, Grendel and I are called together. That's an interesting bit of language. Later, we'll use this term destiny. It's almost as if Beowulf feels like the Grendel monster showing up is fated for Beowulf. This has nothing to do with the Danes. It's got to do with Beowulf. He shows up and says, this is a long time coming. I've been spending my whole life getting ready for this. By the way, do you have any sense with male ego at play here? Is there any kind of chest thumping going on here as well? No, no, no. Let me tell you about just what kind of stud I am. I drove all those giants out of the way, and now I'm here for the prize, the real prize. Grendel the monster, keep reading. Grendel and I are called together, and I've come. Grant me then, notice he asks, he doesn't demand. Grant me then, Lord and protector of this noble place, a single request. I have come so far, shelter of warriors and your people's love friend, that this one favor you should not refuse me, that I, look at the word, what? This is all crucial, learn to be close readers of the poem. What does he say? Now, I don't need, I, hey, dude, I, I came with warriors, but I don't need them. I don't need them. Grendel, pff, are you kidding me? I didn't bring these warriors with me so that we would all fight Grendel. I'm here to fight him. Mano a mano. I'm here one on one. It's almost like it would be an insult if he had to have the help of another man. Let's point out, this is a man standing alone in the fight. Right? This is, dare we say it, the hero, right? This is the individual who says, above all others, I am willing to say, I'm number one. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to prove it. I'm not going to say it, I'm going to prove it. 
can you please let me fight this terrible monster that nobody in your country can even fight? Not the irony of that. Not the irony of that. Beowulf could easily just show up and say to Rothgar, you clearly can't take care of business. I'm going to do it for you, you wretched old man of a king. That's not at all the language here, though. Notice it's, it's, a, it's a eco, but it's checked in the company of the older man. Will you at least let me do this? Will you let me try? Keep reading. I have come so far that I alone, and with the help of my men, may purge all evil from this hole. I have heard, too, that the monster's scorn of men is so great that he needs no weapon and fears none, nor will I. My lord Hygelic might think less... Isn't this interesting? He's not worried about himself. He's worried about what his king will think of him. Look what he says again. My lord Hygelic might think less of me if I let my sword go where my feet were afraid to, if I hid behind some broad linen shield, my hands alone shall fight for me, struggle for life against the monster. He asks not only to fight against the monster, but he says, I want it to be even. If I were to win with weaponry, it might not be considered a fair fight. He's clearly interested in fame, isn't he? How will people speak of this fight long after I'm dead? That is interesting. It isn't just about the contest. It's about being remembered after the contest. And I've had one or two ballplayers who I've taught who have said, you know, that's really interesting. I guess I've never really thought about that. When I was a kid, it was just about the competition and maybe the fruit snack that came at the end. <laughs> but at some point, it became clear to me. I've had a student athlete say this. At some point, it became clear to me, those parents sitting over on the sidelines screaming their lungs out, it mattered to them way more than it mattered to me, and that's why it had to matter to me. Not so much because this was even fun anymore. I've had many athletes who have said, it stopped being fun in middle school when losing became so personal. And the ride home in the minivan was no fun whatsoever. It became at that point the challenge to try to live up to expectations. Notice it's here. He says, I don't know what Heigelic would think of me if I, if I you know, used weapons. There ain't going to be no weapons. I'm going to jack this guy, this monster, and I'm going to do it without any kind of weapons. And, of course, that's exactly what he does, Beowulf too. I, I wish I had more time. Obviously, I could spend an entire semester with a classic epic like this. I'm sorry I don't have it. Let's now turn to page five of your Beowulf packet. Well, as you know, things don't go so well. I mean, they go well, but you always got to have the follow-up to the story, and here it's going to be that, surprise, Beowulf has a mom, and surprise, she, like Beowulf, likes to Grindel. eat people, and uh, 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 Grindel has a mom, thank you. And surprise, uh, Grindel's ma is not so, is not so nice either, right? And uh, to that degree now, uh, Grindel's ma comes in, does some nasties. Now, I'm, I, I'm giving you some, pa some parts of Beowulf that you don't have in your hymnal. That's why page five has been copied for you. Uh, and now I'm in Beowulf 2. I'm going to look at two passages from Beowulf 2 real quickly. We're told that Beowulf comes tramping into the hall the morning after Ashir, the great warrior, has been killed by Grendel's mom. Right? Beowulf will, in fact, ask, how's it going? And Rothgar will speak. I'm, I'm with you now on page 5, first lines. Rothgar spoke, son a uh, lord of the Skildings. Oh, say it. Ask not of pleasure... Pain is renewed for the Danish people. Ashir's dead. He was my comrade, closest of counselors. This is old man, the king. Oh, things are terrible. Beowulf comes in. How's it going? He knows he's been called for a reason, right? Now, he's the hero who has become the super hero. He knows he's needed. So when he shows up, he can be a bit cavalier. What do you need? How's everything going? Everything going okay? Knowing full well, Rothgar didn't call the great hero Beowulf so that they could exchange some tea and have a few muffins to eat, right? Clearly, he's here for a reason. Notice Rothgar's, oh, things are terrible. It will now be Beowulf who will respond. How does the warrior respond in the face of adversity? And some of you will now put to the Beowulf epic itself all of these lines that you heard from adults and from coaches about Nietzsche's great line, that which does not destroy me makes me stronger. Of course, Nietzsche knew this passage well. He himself, a linguist and a student of the classics. Let's listen to what Beowulf has to say. I'm with you now at line 895. Beowulf spoke, son of Ecthiel. I told you, they always tell where they come from. Beowulf spoke, son of Ecthiel. 
Sorrow not, brave one. So here we go. You want to you want to uh, mark these here. Sorrow not, brave one. So notice right away. Fascinating. Beowulf, the young man, will now be giving advice or counsel to the old man. What gives him the right to do this? He Jack Grendel. Right? Now he's called back. Look what he has to say. This will become, and why your hymnal doesn't put these lines, I mean, it tells you a lot about what they're doing with your textbook compilation in giving you just the action of the poem and not lines like this. It's lines like this that explain trophy cases in every high school in America. Let's take a look at it, what he says. Sorrow not, brave one. Better for man to avenge a friend than much to mourn. Put it in your own words, what's he just said? Enough with the what? Enough with the whining and the crying. It's time to do what? You, you lose your pal, you go jack whoever did it. Simple. This is called retributive justice. Do good, get good. Do bad, you're getting jacked. Somebody messes with your pal, you don't stand around whining about it. What is this with this whining stuff? <laughs> Better to avenge a friend than much to mourn. Then look at the philosophic observation that sounds very, we might say, Marcus Aurelius could have said these lines. All men must die. Let him who may win glory ere death. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did Babel just say? Everybody what? Dies. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. Only a... Tension to die. Right. There's something that has to happen before the death. And it is that G word. It is that G word. It is glory. Keep reading. That Gerdian or treasure is best for the noble man. You might want to circle the word noble. When his name survives him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did you just read? It's not enough to live. And it's not enough to die. Your name must survive you. What does that mean? You have to have a legacy. You have to be remembered. There's two ways in the Anglo-Saxon code that happens. One, there it is. Beowulf, son of Ecthiel. We know nothing about Ecthiel. Nothing. Okay, he's just a name in this epic. We know something about Ecthiel. He raised a kiddo named Beowulf. Oh. So all of a sudden we begin to understand this notion that a parent raises a child with certain expectations. It is not the child's life alone. It is Beowulf, son of Ecthia. So one way to be remembered is through your lineage. Another way is through your action. We will discover Beowulf has no son in Beowulf 3. The way he's remembered will be through his actions. Keep reading. Sorrow not, brave one, better for men to gain glory or death. <clears throat> then much to mourn. All men must die, let him and may win glory ere death. That guardian is best for the noble man when his name survives him. Then let us rise up, O ward of the realm, and haste us forth to behold the track of Grindel's dam. And I give you pledge. Here it is. You make your promise. You have to say it out loud. Because once you've said it out loud, you have to keep it or be ashamed or embarrassed of not keeping it. It is the public proclamation of the intentionality that makes the intentionality of value. That's why we have ceremonies in the Western tradition where we stand in front of someone and make promises. Those promises only matter if both parties agree that they matter. Right? In other words, you don't get a sense here that Beowulf is just saying this to be saying this. This is his pledge. Take a look. She, Grendel's mom, shall not in safety escape to cover, to earthly cavern, or forest fastness, or gulf or ocean. Go where she may. This day with patience endure the burden of every woe, as I know you will. Look at how the old man responds to the words of the young man. Up sprang the ancient. Then look at the next line. Every line matters in these kinds of passages. So, how, does, how do the words of Beowulf fall on the ears of Hrothgar, the old man? What does it mean, up sprang the ancient? Oh, he's now rejuvenated. Look at, the next par look at the next parenthetic. Gave thanks 
to God. So this is a pious man, a religious man, a deeply religious man. Before he goes into battle now, he's going to give thanks, this we call gratitude, to divinity. What is he going to give thanks for? For the heartening words, and then there's the language itself, they will have called the hero. Now this will raise a question about which you will be writing in a couple of weeks. The origination of the value of the hero. What is the hero? Why must a culture have heroes? And where does this notion even come from? The hero is the individual who does two things. He calls, he calls others, normals, his own compadres, he calls them to a higher standard. That's the first thing. But two, and clearly, more importantly, in the Anglo-Saxon epic and motif, he then does it. He then does it. He doesn't just call out his normals. This is what we've got to do. He then goes and he does it. Of course, Beowulf will have some great accomplishment. He, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of iffy the way it ends up happening for him. But ultimately he does. Now I'm ready for you on page six. Uh, this is what we call the famous Hrothgar speech at the end of Beowulf II. <clears throat> and again, inexplicably, these lines don't end up in your anthology, which is the oversight of all oversights, because this is such an important set of lines. Beowulf has done his thing. He's returned now victorious. Hurrah, Beowulf the great hero. And it's Hrothgar who will speak. Notice this. It isn't Beowulf, the great warrior, who will speak. It's Hrothgar, the old man. And when he does so, all of the thanes or soldiers stand in silence in front of him to show respect. Let's take a look at what he has to say. Uh, I'm working now on that page six. Uh, then outspoke Hrothgar, Hefelding's son, and all the retainers were silent and still. I'm at line 1160. These lines you'll want to mark. Well may he say, whose judgment is just, recalling to memory men of the past, this earl was born of a better stock. In other words, he was so successful because of his lineage. Of his lineage. There's this early notion of DNA, you see. Uh, we, uh, Plato was already on to this, though. Great parents raise great children, this kind of thing. You know, great fighters, fathers raise great fighter sons and all of that. Your fame, friend Beowulf, is blazoned abroad over all wide ways and to every people. In manful fashion, you've showed your strength, your might, and wisdom. My word, I will keep the plighted friendship we formerly pledged. Long shall you stand as a state of your people. And do you see the ellipsis there? That's because it goes on and on and on for quite some time. Hrothgar talking about what an amazing warrior Beowulf is. But then he comes back. Tis a wondrous marvel. How mighty God and gracious spirit bestows on men the gift of wisdom and goodly lands and princely power. He rules over all. He suffers a man of lordly line to set his heart on his own desires, of words and fullness of worldly joy, a fair homeland and the sway of cities, and wide, the wide dominion of many a realm, an ample kingdom. God gives, in other words, man success. Till, cursed with folly, the thoughts of his heart take no heed of his end, Wow, does that sound Platonist or what? At some point, after success and success and success, the thoughts of his heart take no heed of his end. It was Marcus Aurelius who said, Soon you will have forgotten all things, and all things will have forgotten you. This is a very stoic kind of position here. Sooner or later, you got to die. Who's saying this? Who's saying these words? Young or old? Old man talking to young kid. Take a look at what he says next. He lives in luxury, knowing not want, knowing no shadow of sickness or age, no haunting sorrow darkens his spirit, no hatred or discord deepens the war. The world is sweet to his every desire, and evil sails not. Until, in his heart, pride, notice it's capitalized, overpowering gathers and grows. The warder slumbers, the guard of his spirit, too sound is that sleep, too sluggish the weight of worldly affairs, too pressing the foe. The archer who loosens the arrows of sin. Then is his heart pierced under his helm, his soul in his bosom with bitter dart. He has no defense for the fierce assaults of the loathsome fiend. Notice fiend capitalized. What he long has cherished seems all too little. In anger and greed, he gives no guardian of plated rings. You'll know a bad king because he's no longer generous.